We continue our series on the Apostles' Creed with our confession that on the third day he rose from the dead. We've seen that Jesus is our atoning sacrifice that covers us before God. We have seen that he is our substitute who suffered in our place God's judgment for sin. We have seen that he has already defeated the power of sin and death. And now we come to the resurrection event itself. So we're going to turn to two powerful passages on the bodily resurrection of Jesus, what that means for us. We're going to turn to Acts 10, verses 39 through 43, and then 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 3. Both of these are my translations of the text. And in Acts 10, Peter is preaching in the household of uh, of Cornelius. And he says, we are martyrs, we are witnesses to everything he did in the Jewish homeland and in Jerusalem. They executed him by hanging him on a tree. This one God raised up on the third day and made him manifest, not to all the covenant people, but to the witnesses, to the martyrs chosen beforehand by God, to us who ate and drank with him after rising from the dead. He commanded us to proclaim to the covenant people and to bear witness that he is one appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets bear witness to him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. We turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in the third verse. Paul writes, For I delivered to you as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised up on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Cephas, and that's Rock or Rocky, Rockhead. It's Peter's nickname. Then to the twelve. Afterwards, he appeared to more than 500 believers at once, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Then last of all, as to one stillborn, he also appeared to me. Now if Christ, this is verse 12, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised up from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Preach it, Paul. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then has Christ not been raised up? If Christ has not been raised up, then our preaching is empty and worthless, as is your faith. We are then also liable as false witnesses of God because we have testified that he raised up Christ, whom he has not raised up if the dead are not raised up. For if the dead are not raised up, neither has Christ been raised up. If then Christ has not been raised up, your faith is is worthless and you are still in the grip of you are still under the power of your sins then also those who have died believing in Christ are gone for good if in life as we know it only we have hoped in Christ then we are to be pitied most of all but in fact Christ has been raised up from the dead, first fruit of those who have died. This is the word of God for the people of God.
What I'm going to tell you is not to draw attention to myself. I just think you need to know how I got here this morning. You need to know that this week was rough. Searching for something to say from God's Word is a hard enough task to do it week in, week out, difficult. God is faithful. But this week, it felt impossible. I I can't explain it. I'm not going to go into the psychology of it, but as I search for comfort and direction, I felt lost. God seemed distant. I also felt quite ashamed because, hey, look at our topic for the week. I love basking in the glory of the resurrection as God's display of triumph over sin and death. I relish declaring that Christ is who he always said he was. I love raising my far too often loud voice, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. If ever there was a sermon softball, it's got to be the resurrection. And here I was, count 0 and 2. Felt like I was going to strike out. It wasn't coming this week. I felt weak and inadequate, as often we all do at different points in our lives and for different reasons. But I think I was where I was by no mistake, no happenstance. It wasn't a matter of just the weather or biology or something of that nature. I believe that God had a plan. God put me where I needed to be to receive the word I needed to share. Because what we needed to do, and I have have read this text so many times, I thought that I knew it, and I realized something that I had never, ever seen before. What I realized is that as I felt that God was silent, as I was having a hard time, as we all have hard times, we actually mirror Paul as he wrote here to this church in Corinth. We mirror Paul as he hands on to his readers what he tells us he received as most important. Think about the formula that he gives you this morning. He must have recited this hundreds, if not thousands of times during the course of his preaching. And he must have said it at least hundreds of times to this group of hardheads in Corinth. Christ died according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And He appeared. Don't you get it yet? And as He struggles with it one more time, as He goes through the litany, what I never saw before is I think He was on the verge of despair Himself. They're never going to get it. They're lost in their quarrels. Didn't you pick that up in verses 12 through 19 from 1 Corinthians 15? Look at all the mental gymnastics he has to do going back and forth on the same point, looking at it from all these different vantage points. You say if Christ has not been raised, well, this is the outcome of thinking that... They've heard it time and again, yet still they are debating whether there will be a resurrection. Paul must have gone to seminary. Some are just trying to be theologically cute, novel. Others, divisive in order to gain power. Some are panicking, though they've heard it a hundred times. 
They're panicking because Christ has not returned yet and their loved ones, their friends have died. And they're wondering whether Uncle John is going to be included in the resurrection because Christ hasn't returned and he's dead. And and what does this mean? Round and round Paul goes. He's debating with them. He's engaging with them. He's trying to get them to see their absurdity. And I feel sorry for him this week because I was feeling sorry for myself. And I felt most sorry of all when I looked at what he penned in verse 8. Did you catch it? He's given the good news. And then he says, last of all, to one stillborn, he also appeared to me. The word for stillborn, or in some translations, untimely born, is the Greek word Ectromati, which means a stillbirth. It's a child who arrives dead. As Paul looks back on his life, as he looks back on where God has brought him, especially in this moment of trial, as he's trying to explain yet once again what he thought he had firmly established, he sees that he was locked in a death like theirs, a death like ours. And not only was he locked in it, at one point he was the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Paul, with a big sigh that I'd never seen before underneath the text, looks back on the futility of who he once was. And in a few words, Paul points out that he was headed to the pit. Final separation from God. He was a dud. Though in his zeal for God at one time, he had thought himself a stud. And confronted with these quarrelsome folks, I think that the tempter was whispering in his ear, Paul, you are useless. It's been a waste. You are stillborn, untimely born. And Paul, I imagine, cries out, Why am I? And why, O oh God, do you have me here? And I'd never seen this before because this is where we often find ourselves on the ash pile lamenting our fate, crying out, woe is me, unable to bear it anymore. We're sitting right next to Paul and we're asking the question, is there a resurrection? Because our actions don't seem to indicate that we believe there is one. But you know, the wonderful thing about the word of the Lord is that it eventually comes. When the Word of God finally broke in despite the thickness of my skull and the hardness of my heart, I discovered that God had been speaking plainly the whole time. And it's there in the text right in front of you. Psalm 30 verse 5 puts it like this. Weeping may linger for the night. Peter preaching in the household of Cornelius says in Acts 10.40 This one God raised up On the third day, Paul says it in here in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 4, he was buried, he was raised up on the third day according to the Scriptures. What I'm driving at, in case you're unsure, is this. We are so quick to declare Christ's victory over the powers. We are so quick to triumph in our proclamation. We are so quick to come to the foot of the cross with a nodding glance at Jesus' sorrows. We are so quick to sing, Jesus paid it all. We are so quick to proclaim Christ is risen he is risen indeed we are in such need of Christ's victory in our life that we jump over the hardest truth of all that resurrection that life that victory that God's power in our life 
as we see here in Jesus, only comes on the third day. We skip Holy Saturday. We want to forget the cold, cold tomb. We turn away from the fact that for us and for our salvation, Christ endured death and separation from God, even to the point that from the end of day one until the early start of day three, we, his disciples, the entire created order, even the deepest recesses of the heart and fellowship of God experienced, tasted of the still silence of death. And like me this week, like we when we're throwing a pity party for ourselves, we can't hear from God. We can't experience His presence because we do not want the struggle. If I were to lay an indictment at the feet of Jesus Christ in North America in the 21st century, it would be only one indictment. We do not want the struggle. We want the good news. We want it packaged nicely and conveniently. We would like to take it out, preferably by 12. Go home. Relax. And forget about it till this time next week. We do not want to die to our own plans for our lives. We do not want to enter the tomb because if we linger just a bit long, we might have to acknowledge how fragile and broken we really are. But you can't get to the third day without going through the second. You can't say he was crucified and then just skip on to the resurrection. You must say, as the creed reminds us, that he was dead. He was buried. And on the third day, he was raised. From no hope, no future, to hope and life. If I could put this all another way, at the heart of our faith is the hard but transforming truth that God in Christ is God of both the living and the dead. That's what Acts 10.42, Romans 14.9 tells us. In our belief that on the third day he was raised from the dead, we have it plainly, though it scares the dickens out of us, we have it plain that God specializes in making a way out of dead ends. That's how God works. That's how God operates. There is no other logic you can use to approach the majesty of God in Christ for you. I'm sorry. The Lord Jesus has defeated death and made a way that all of us are going to have to pass through, both literally and figuratively. We're going to have to pick up our cross and follow him. And that means day one, dying. Day two, loss of all we hold dear. Day three, and then only in the chill hours of the cold morning with nobody else around. Only then, new dawn. It's only in our dying that we, it's only in our dying that we rise. It's only by losing our life through trust in the Lord Jesus, united with him in a death like his, that we gain our lives. Now, if I ended the sermon here, I know you'd be like, oh, thanks for depressing me, Pastor Sam. But there's, there's a beautiful thing here in his death and rising. Not only did Jesus defeat the powers in his death and burial, as his once dead body left that tomb, it was glorified, it was transformed, 
It was new. It was something the world had never seen before. It was new creation. Christ's raised and glorified body is a word from God on high that brings life to dead men and women, giving life despite our hopeless condition. New hope, new promise, new life, a new body, a full manifestation of the wedding of heaven and earth we've always longed for and for which we pray that prayer that Jesus taught us saying, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He brings with him the hope, as Acts 10.43 tells us, that belief upon his name brings forgiveness. Forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of our brokenness. Forgiveness from a past we cannot change. Forgiveness and new beginnings. Our belief in the resurrection of Jesus is our saying that we have been reborn into a living hope by the faithfulness of the one who raised Jesus from the dead. We who were once in the silent darkness of the tombs have been brought out alive into the sunshine, brought out as he was. As he was raised, so too shall we be raised. Death no longer reigns over him, and we have seen it. And how does Jesus himself put it in John chapter 11, verse 25? Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. Even though we die to ourselves, even though our best laid plans come to naught, even though all the world should fail us, even though our bodies betray us, and can I get somebody with arthritis to say amen? Even though we will eventually make our way six feet under some cold, hard Tennessee clay, because of what Christ has done for us, we shall live. And not just live, we shall live abundantly. We shall live as new creatures. We shall live with a sense, a conviction that in all things, God brings new possibilities. That's exactly what we see in Peter himself in Acts chapter 10. We couldn't read the whole thing, otherwise I'd be reading Scripture all day. But if you go back and look at it for yourself, here's what you see. Here Peter was in the house of a Gentile, a Roman centurion, no less. God had sent him there by way of a dream. Now he obeyed, but believe you me, he had objections. And this is actually his proclamation here in chapter 10 is unique among all the proclamations of the resurrection of Jesus in the entire New Testament because Peter actually botches the job. Did you catch it? He was carving out all the distinctions, the divisions as he declared Christ's resurrection. What does he say? He declares that Christ was manifest not to all the people, not to all the covenant people, but to the witnesses, martyrs, chosen beforehand by God to us. Peter is sure God is for him. And he, he has hopes for his people, his covenant people there in the Jewish homeland. Hey, we're going to go back to the synagogues. We're going to pray. We're going to speak in tongues. We're, all these things are going to happen. Eventually, Israel's going to be included on in. But too bad for you, Cornelius. I'm just not so sure about our, the household of a Roman centurion. I don't know why I'm here. I'm just obeying. I'm going to tell you what I was told to tell you. But as Peter preaches that Christ rose in accordance with Scripture, he lets it slip in verse 43. That belief upon the Lord Jesus brings forgiveness of sins, reconciliation. And when he says those words, it happens. We didn't read the verse. Maybe we should have. It happens at that instant. The very next verse says the Holy Spirit swooped down 
and Cornelius and his Gentile household was brought in. Those who were in the greatest darkness, they too have seen a great light. Peter, now overcome and unsure of what to do next, he he just shrugs his shoulders. And he, he gets about the work of baptizing the household. Who am I to stand in between them? The God has poured the Spirit out on them. And in that moment, Peter himself died to what he once was, so that along with Cornelius and his unclean Gentile family, they might experience the fuller life that Christ and his resurrection bring. And God is a master of this. Because this is how God operates. God frustrates our plans. If you can't deal with very much frustration, I'm sorry, brothers and sisters, you're going to have to work on your endurance that produces patience. God frustrates our plans just so we can get at that moment where we're going to sit in the ash pile for a little while. We're going to throw them on our heads. We're going to get the sackcloth out. We're going, to, we're going to cry out, woe is me. And in that moment, He's going to pick us up out of that ash heap that we find so comfortable that we've shrouded ourselves in like grave clothes. And He's not just going to pick us up. He's going to, he's going to shake us off a bit. He's going to dust us off. And when he does, he gives us a new robe, a new life, a new name, a new identity in him. And brothers and sisters, he has a robe. He has a name. He has a life for you. And you can find it today. For in fact, Christ has been raised up from the dead. That's what Paul tells us. I love, that's one of my favorite passages. But in fact, you thought it was one way, but in fact, Christ has been raised. That is God's clear word to us when we feel alone and cut off. The sure word. It's a word that sustains in life and in death. And there's no other word like it in heaven or on earth because it comes by way of the God-man, Jesus Christ, whose name alone has power to save. In Him. Today. This instant, as you go outside these doors, you don't have to wait for it. You can share in the glory of His resurrection. That's what it means to say Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we ought not just say it one time a year at Easter. We ought to say it every time we gather. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray.